evening we're going to call to order the Thursday, July 26th meeting of the Planning Board. Um, it is 7.05, 7.06, um, and we are officially convened. We start our meeting with public comment on any items that are not on our agenda. So would anybody like to make a comment regarding any issue that doesn't appear on our agenda? Last call. Uh, we'll move to our 7 p.m. item, which is a continuation of a 40-R review with Sunwood Development Corporation for 28 residential units off of Olander Drive, Northampton Map ID 31C-17. Um, before the presentation, one quick announcement. I was one of the people who was not here at the last meeting, so I have viewed the, the uh, recording of the meeting that took place on the 28th of June, um, so I am up to speed on the, the original part of the hearing. So. Um, and you might please to you might want to. We do also have two new members of the planning board. So George, right. would you like to introduce so yourself? My name is George Kohat, and I also reviewed the uh, video and the uh, transcript up there. I was available for some time. Right. Interesting. My name is Krista Burnett, and I did the same. Great. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Chris Jaber from Berkshire Design Group. I also was not at the last meeting um, <laughs> to present. I'm filling in for Jeff Squire, who unfortunately decided to climb a mountain in Switzerland this week instead of join us. <laughs> um, so uh, at the previous meeting there was uh, a more full discussion uh, of the site uh, and so I'm primarily here to update on some of the outstanding issues that were left open uh, and led to the continuation of uh, which there are primarily three the first one being the stormwater permit uh, we have advanced the stormwater permit application uh, quite a bit since the last meeting but it has not been issued yet uh, has been submitted to DPW. I spoke with Doug McDonald this morning, um, and he's overall satisfied with uh, the plan. Uh, it seems as though we've been able to account for the impervious area across the entire site um, adequately, which was his biggest concern, this being the last major piece of stormwater that's going to be built um, before the, the development is complete. Um, we also um, have uh, proposed adding some water quality swales around some of the interior yard drains to add some more low impact development. Um, and so those are all positive, but uh, Doug felt that he's, again, this being the last piece uh, with, with all the details uh, to come that he needed a little more time before he could issue that with, with proper conditions. So that's where the stormwater permit stands. The second item was ADA access to the site. Uh, between the previous meeting and this one, there's been a meeting in the fields with, uh, with the developer, the city and the neighbors to discuss the access and an agreement has been reached among those parties that ADA access to the site can be provided through a concrete walkway through Memorial Park, which is uh, on the map. My mouse will show up. Uh, it keeps disappearing on me. Um, yeah, it's, it's the plus sign, let's see. Oh, that's annoying, I can't figure out how to make it something more visible. Um, but it is at, at the extreme bottom end of this image. Um, you'll see at, near the entrance of the site, there is a single family home, and then the next lot down is where the park is located. Um, the agreement would, was that there would that uh, Sunwood, as part of this development, uh, would build the ADA accessible walk through the park um, to the standard of the plan, which my understanding is has already been approved by the planning board, um, and that cost sharing um, of that path would be between Sunwood and uh, the neighbor group. And then finally, um, there was the uh, request to summarize uh, the number of trees that would need to be replaced if this application had been uh, applied for new, uh, under the new um, tree ordinance. And I have a table here summarizing that. Um, so if we exclude uh, dead or diseased trees, uh, we have 1,886 total caliper inches of live trees that would be cut uh, under the new ordinance that would require a replacement of 934 inches and the proposed plan includes 329 inches to be planted. Chris, can you clarify that's um, 
the trees over 20 inch DBH. It's Correct. Not total. That's not total okay. removal. Um, that is that is only the ones that would be subject to the ordinance, which are 20 20 inch DBH or greater. And can you just clarify? That's not necessarily a clean like one third. Like, how did you arrive at that figure? Um, we took the plans uh, as was proposed. Um, it was not, uh, the, the proposed plans were not created to try to achieve any particular ratio. Uh, that is the, based on the landscaping plan that was developed first for the original site and then modified for the new one. And to just clarify both for the public and for the board, this is a continuation of the hearing, so public, the public hearing is still open. Yeah. So um, we'll start as by entertaining any questions from the board for the presenter and then we can questions or comments from the public. So are, are there any comments from the board regarding these three items? So I guess I'm confused if, if what was it, um, 900 are required and 300 and some are provided, what happens to the difference? So that was the question that came up last. So this is an amendment of a plan that was approved before the zoning ordinance changed to create a calculation for tree replacement for significant trees of 20 inches or larger. So the discussion that came up last meeting was um, um, knowing that this was an amendment, they were falling under the old rules and then the board asked them to see how um, that compares to the new rules in terms of the number of trees they were planting. So um, it was merely a request to understand those that variation, and there was a discussion about whether there should be more planting or whether the board was comfortable with the idea that they were amending a plan um, that um, was approved under the old rules. So the question then would be what required means? I mean, from staff perspective, we feel that because it's an amendment, they're amending certain pieces of the plan, so they are they're still amending what, um, based on that permit that was issued before the tree replacement um, zoning ordinance was adopted. And um, if I can clarify a little bit on that labeling on the table, it's it's uh, the trees that would have been required uh, under an application under the new rules. So I gather your position or the applicant's position would be that they're not required for this. That, that we are amending the original um, plan uh, which was approved uh, before the creation of the tree ordinance. So from the video of the last meeting, there seemed to be some back and forth about whether or not that was appropriate. It sounds as if we have, had not come to some agreement on that. Right, it sounded uh, from the end of the meeting that you, you, the board wanted to see what those numbers were. Right, so the question is, you, you know, is this substantially similar to the prior plan and do we? No you know, sort of act as if the current tree replacement requirements are not in effect because they weren't in effect when the first plan was developed? Or are we in a position to say, you know, that was then, this is now, we've got to find a way to increase the, the number of caliper inches that are being replaced. So that's where, that's where we're at. And that's, my understanding is that because there is no stormwater permit, we will be continuing this for another month. Is that correct? Well, and well no, so the board um, just, you will need to continue it, but the next meeting is August 9th, so it's two weeks. Okay. But the, the application and the calculations and the plan revisions were just submitted on Tuesday to DPW, so they have not had any time to sort of go through, and there are some other changes that need to be made, catch basins um, need to be added to the plan, okay. um, things of that sort. That, that's just sort of the first cut. Um, looking at that, so the uh, the rules say the board can't close the hearing until a stormwater permit has been issued. Okay. So it will need to be continued, but to but the we extent can't that this question to another two weeks, we should. I no, I think you all have should take the opportunity to close out all the other issues and sort of leave the stormwater piece to yeah. um, okay. that final, and then the final conditions can incorporate, you know, what you all talk about tonight plus right. whatever DPW recommends in terms. Of well, having watched, go ahead. So on the trees, the 396 inches, those are again a minimum of 20 inches, as you refer to the DPH. What are, so are we the, talking? So it's the total number of inches that um, are being planted. Right. So, and 
it's measured, for new trees, it's me measured in caliper, which is a different location on the tree than a mature tree that you take down. So the 390, whatever it changed, the number is, is the total, are the total number of inches uh, per, based on the plan that's been submitted. Um, I haven't checked the numbers because sometimes the trees, the other piece of it is some, the tree schedule, the planting schedule sometimes says between two and two and a half inches, you know, depending on what's at the nursery and all of that. So I don't know if this number is the bottom, the two inch versus the two and a half inch or if it's <coughs> the two and a half inch. Um, and you all could also specify that minimum, you want a minimum of, you know, two and a half or minimum of two. Um, to come up to this number of 329 instead of you know figuring out the better. So at the last meeting, I think one of the things that came up was the idea, and we didn't decide on this by any stretch, but it was proposed that maybe you guys could think about doing adding some extra trees either here or donating other trees to the city of Northampton as a sort of gesture toward the new requirements. Um, so not requiring you to meet the full 934, but more in that direction was that considered or discussed further uh, um, do you know what if any discussion there was on that I'm Shaw Perry from Sunwood development and uh, we were waiting for input from the city of uh, our position is that we are applying for a permit that's been allowed to carry the number of trees that we have so we included that in our application so it, it's really now on us to figure out if if we are going down the path of not requiring the, the maximum tree replacement requirement that would be in effect today and you know and if we will kind of allow this reduced amount and my understanding is that one of the arguments for that is that this that hospital hill is a unique project it is unlike any other development throughout the city and that this is part of the concept plan that was originally put forth that this portion of the site be developed. Um, you know, certainly somebody can make an argument that, you know, this, the spirit of what we're trying to do has changed over time and that, you know, we should sort of to the maximum extent possible try to, to meet whatever standards are in place today. Um, but that is a question that we do have to And if I could, I would, I would add to the first half of that that and this project in particular is substantially similar to the co-housing project that was proposed and approved in 2015. It's a small, somewhat smaller number of units, but a similar layout and, and a, essentially an identical concept in terms of co-housing. Right. Yeah, well, and there's always one person, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, other thoughts? Should we go, just go around the board? Well, we'll start by having discussion among the board. If we'd like to pause for discussion and hear from the public and then Discussion. We can do that. You'd rather do that? Okay. Let's hear from the public, and if you could, as always, come to the podium, state your name and your address um, for us, and then provide whatever feedback you may have. No comments on the tree issue? Then we're on our own. Figure it out. <laughs> comments? Uh, I think they. they didn't make that much change, much change. So, and um, it should be up to them to show the good faith um, because it's, it's kind of a quite old, right, in terms of the zoning, um, the requirement for the, the, the trees. And uh, I think it will be up to them to, since there is no public can hear to kind of a, make an argument. Okay, so you're of the mindset that this is an amendment, we should not apply today's standards to yeah. a prior permit. Other yeah, I, get to, uh, I think my view would be the same. I think given the overall scope of the project, the changes are pretty minimal. I mean, it's been, it's what, four or six units fewer? Yeah. Um, that, that given, as I say, the, the scope and description of the project, it's pretty much the same thing. I don't think it would be fair to impose current requirements on what is essentially a previously approved plan. I kind of feel the same way for the existing application that 
making them go back and have to redo something that we're doing now. Right. Um, one comment that, that Mark Sullivan made in the prior meeting uh, was to request if it were possible to kind of see, to visualize the current site plan over the existing and see if there are other places in the site that could accommodate, you know, again, as Janice sure. said, kind of inching up towards what that requirement would be by mm -hmm. today's standards. Was that an undue burden or was that possible to, to visualize? Um. If we're talking about broad strokes of, of buildings and parking lots, I think that's reasonable. I would hesitate to say that we could put too much detail in there because it's very difficult to layer it in a way that's readable. Yeah. Um, but if that, that's certainly something that we could do at least at a, at a basic level. Yeah, I don't know how other people felt who were at the prior meeting when Mark made that recommendation, if that's critical to figuring out where you fall on this issue. <coughs> earlier this afternoon when I was watching right. it that I saw him say that that could be helpful. Yeah. Um, and I would also say that, that um, preface that with it could be misleading um, also at the, at the level at which we have to do it um, in terms of the simplicity of, of the plan. We may obscure steep slopes where it would be inappropriate to plant trees. Um, so there, there would be a, a little bit of uh, ambiguity to it. But at, at base it could be, we could present something okay. if, if the board wanted. Um, <clears throat> so it, it is my first meeting. I don't want to go against the other members. I wasn't here for the, the back and forth except for the video. But I think the first plan was approved in 2015, three years ago. A lot has happened in Northampton since then about the understanding of trees and the tree canopy and the planting of trees and the inventory of trees. Um, and that's, I think, where this new ordinance came from, the new regulations. So I don't think we're doing justice to that. Um, by <clears throat> allowing the developer to move that far away from those that criteria um, and then I think when a developer does come in and ask for amendments the developer does open themselves up to what is the current kind of state of um, ordinances or regulations so <clears throat> and also that's just a very very wooded area of the state hospital We're, they're going to lose a great portion of that during the development, an incredible amount. So much more than I think they're even offering to. So I would think they could come at least halfway, you know, I don't want to be a negotiator around exact things, but if they came up to like 600 or something away from the 320, I think that would be reasonable. Um, while they're doing the planting, it's a, certainly an extra cost on their part to buy that stock, but they're going to have crews in their planting, there's ways to do that in a way that uh, will look certainly reasonable. Um, yeah, I just think we've come a long way as far as understanding about trees and how we're losing more trees all the time for development. So I would pose that ready that they can move up to them. Yeah, I'm of a similar mindset. I mean, I think, I think largely people are right that this was approved under previous rules, and so to ask them to meet the full or current requirements seems undue when we heard about the high cost of that at the last meeting. Um, but at the same time, I think some kind of substantial gesture toward the current requirements would just be appropriate given where the city is today. How do folks feel about this kind of at least at least half of the requirement based on current? I think my, my, my opinion would be that it isn't a question of the reasonableness of the current requirement. As you say, if there's maybe maybe it's a, a, a better requirement or a better provision of the zoning ordinance that was previously there. The question in my mind is whether it can reasonably be applied to them. Um, and it's it, again, I think it's a quite a small amendment given the scope of a project like this, and it's just the fact that. The ordinance is better now than it used to be. Doesn't mean it can be applied to that. Either. But I also think what we're happening, I mean, if your suggestion is to bring it up to half, we're talking about an extra I'm 150 inches. It doesn't seem like a huge amount, but right. it's a it's a meaningful gesture without being right. overkill. Kristen, Uri, any comment on the sort of proposition uh, of trying to get at least halfway towards today's standard? To be or not to be, right? <laughs> <laughs> to tree or not? To tree 
Uh, I'm kind of a. It makes sense, but the fact that it makes sense does not kind of mandate or obligate or make them obligated to do it. Um, I kind of uh, sticking with what I think. Okay. Yeah. I have a question, Carolyn, for you. And I didn't see this in the video. And if it was mentioned, and I'm sorry if I missed it, but um, what are the precedents with similar, have we had similar amendment issues unrelated to tree requirements, but I mean, what is our process when amendments yeah. come before us? I mean, do we or do we not require current adherence to current standards? Um, so um, I think that uh, typically, yes, when you come for an amendment, it sort of opens up everything. Yeah. Um, and, um, but it doesn't mean that the board is necessarily obligated to um, go back and make adjustments based on the rules that have been um, modified. I mean, the one thing that's, so um, I will say though that um, there's a window in which you can substantially start a project under an order permit. They filed within that window um, whereas other projects could come back, other applicants could come back and amend a, a permit um, anytime, even outside that window of substantialist starting. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be... Like our next yeah. Right, right. So when, in that scenario, it's, um, I think there'd be no question that you'd have to say, well, you have to follow the new rules because there's a reason why there's a window in which to start your project right. because um, policies change and ordinances change. Um, so um, I think that um, in this case, uh, so again, you could go either way, but I think there's a strong um, merit to um, allowing them to continue under the rules that were in place because it was still within that. That seems more uh, reasonable to me. I mean, I, my initial reaction from the video was where you guys are, which is that, you know, we don't replace trees because they're pretty, we replace them because there's serious ecological services and there's stormwater management, there's a whole host of other reasons that, you know, that tree replacement is important and that, of course, we should always be applying current standards. But the development window seems that, it seems like we have already kind of said this is the, you know, maybe that's something that we look at separately and apart from this application, if that's very long or, if, you know, we're seeing this issue come up again. Um, you know, I think in terms of a good faith effort, it would be, it, I would love to see it be at least half or more, you know, of what the current requirement is, but that argument seems to be valid that it's difficult to retroactively, uh, you know, take this amendment that's within this window of time and apply today's current replacement requirements. So I would be inclined to, you know, ask that if there is a way to increase that number, that it be increased, but that we not condition, you know, adhering to the current tree replacement guidelines, um, you know, and accept either this number that's put forth or, you know, something closer to 470, um, you know, 470 inches, if that's feasible. Is that reasonable? Yeah, I also appreciate Jenna's other suggestion that if, if it's impractical because of the planting plan and the topography that if they wanted to perhaps donate some trees, for the city's effort in other areas, that might also be something to look at. I like that. I mean, that does underscore that, you know, again, yeah, this isn't, it's not just that we like to look at trees, but they have a very yeah. important function in terms of what we do when we develop land. You know, that there's, that's the reason that we have this ordinance. Um, is that something that we could condition or something we could just request? Um, well, if you want them as a board to, do more, plant more trees, you know. Uh, the difference between what they're showing at half is 138 inches. Um, so if you want them to do more, you don't have to specify that they can do them on site or, I mean, you could say on site or otherwise following the uh, um, established procedure in the zoning ordinance for planting off site. So we already have that mechanism for people to plant on other locations off site if it doesn't work. Um, but I think you need to make the decision. Do you think they need to do this or not? And not, 
leave it as a suggestion. So you're saying that either we should just approve it as is or requirement, but yep. not approve it with a suggestion? Right. 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 Yeah, we can't make a suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Do we need to take any kind of preliminary test vote, or how are we feeling about if we were to not require it? I mean, ultimately, you can, you're not closing the hearing tonight, right. and you'll be issuing a decision in presumably in two weeks. So. Um, you you could take a straw poll now, but it doesn't mean anything's going to stand. Or you could just leave it and for more time. Right. I like your idea about deciding the issues as they're here and not have to read this. Right. Uh, so the question is the existing 329 or 329 plus 138, whatever that number is. And Alan, we're, what are you thinking? I, I think that notwithstanding that it's always a good idea to plant more trees, I just don't think we have the authority, nor do I think it would be fair, to require it. So I think we stick with what they were granted previously. I would have to say the same thing. 329, it would be nice to see a gesture of more trees, but not to require it. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I guess I would go the other way. I think uh, it's really, it would be important to at least get some more trees in that area. You know, a buddy of this property is a, another big, huge open space, and who knows what the what two things are going to be there. But, uh, I just think the amount that's being taken down and uh, the amount that's even required to plan it doesn't come close to what they're doing. And, and I think a, a, a project of this scale can accommodate that kind of uh, extra without breaking anybody's kind of bottom line um, for uh, so, so I guess I would vote for re re requiring them to add that extra 139. Um, Alan, you brought up, you said you didn't think that it would be legally appropriate or feasible for us to require Yeah, I don't that. think so. Is that something that we could ask Alan, or is that something that we should ask? Or? The other Alan. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you could. I mean, we are sort of. We we suggested that the applicant follow this process as an amendment, mm -hmm. and this was one of the major issues that they were um, grappling with is how to how to meet the new ordinance. So certainly from the city's perspective, we feel comfortable that it goes forward under the old rules. So I don't think we necessarily need to okay. do that if you want to. I official opinion for the city solicitor. Right, right. Um, I I would agree with that. I kind of come over from you know this thinking. You know, generally, it's always nice when we have enough discussion that we sort of all come to consensus on something. But I think this is a fairly you know it's very reasonable to be on either side of it. But I think from this you know because this is a complex you know there's a lot of different issues going on right now to keep things moving forward. I would say that. I would Except that we'll stick with the number that was originally granted, underscoring the importance of adhering to the current standards for, you know, in general. And that's something that, if this were to come up again, that, you know, I think it's um, probably, if we're outside of the development window, that, you know, that would have been a big red flag. But for this particular issue, I would say let's move forward with the current, the current number. Can we, can you explain a little bit more about the two versus two and a half, um, how, how that number was arrived at and how to kind of maximize the coverage given, given this? Yeah, so you have the, I don't know if you have the plans, Chris, but can I just, uh, yeah. um, I'm just going to look at the planting schedule. Okay. Um, so I think what, you, you know, if you're sort of, I mean, they, I guess the easiest thing to do would be if you're thinking you want a guarantee there's 329 inches, then you can just say 329 inches worth of trees. Um, and they, of course, have to meet the minimum standard of two inches. So I don't know if that number was gained by looking at the schedule and picking two and a half and adding those up or the two inch number. And I, in fact, I can't, I don't remember exactly what this planting schedule said, but I guess it doesn't much matter in that if you want to see 329 
despite what was on the planting schedule, you could just say 329. Okay. I think that would, that would sounds like I wouldn't want to do anything to inadvertently end up with less than that. So yeah, yeah, so yeah and we specific. certainly, uh, you know, we tried to count that accurately. I don't know the answer to whether we counted at two inches or two and a half inches, but our intention is to plant no fewer than 329. If I might, one last thing, just while we're on trees, I know in the past five, six years, there's been a couple of issues with some of the planting that has happened up at Hospital Hill. I'm not as privy as to all the details. Carolyn, I don't know if you know, some of the trees died and maybe weren't replaced or were planted in inappropriate spots. Has there been any kind of new plan to address that or is there anything we should put in place here to make sure that that doesn't happen again? Yeah, I think the issue really is, um, there needs to be more oversight of the landscapers who are doing the installation because they really don't know. Um, for the most part, most of them aren't planting the way that you're supposed to plant. And so that's the issue. Um, so there are, there's a tree detail that we're required to, to have followed. And I think the issue would be we just need to make sure and you can do that in the condition that um, the, and that the, that be overseen by you know the landscape architect to make sure it's set correctly or that certainly afterwards they have to certify that they've all been checked and set we would with this number of trees we would do spot checks <laughs> um, but we we would probably the best thing to do is probably rely on the certification that they've done the individual of every tree before final sign off so we can do that but yes it's important in We've been trying to be more rigorous about making sure the planting's um, details are accurate, but also um, following up afterwards, you know, that it's actually installed correctly. The city's very involved, in particularly when it's within the right of way to make sure the contractors are doing it correctly. So what is that condition? Does that condition say that the applicant provide written documentation that trees have been planted according to details yeah so I Just think there are probably a number of things that we've looked at at a staff level that should be um, certified and and be more specific about that 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 ranges from you know making sure that the final the finished grades are exactly as shown on plan because there's very complex grading on this site and any change to that is going to affect drainage it's going to affect a lot of different things so I think there's probably a you know a list of five or six items that should um, be part of the condition that say that certification has to happen at certain fresh periods through construction <laughs> and then a final certification. So that it's not waiting to the end to go back and say, well, we already paid, we did all the stuff, we can't go back and regrade, right? So. Okay, is there any requirement that they sur trees um, <clears throat> survive for any period of time? Um, you, well, um, there is a requirement for all, any project that comes before the planning board, they have a planting plan, if a tree dies, the owners are required to replace those trees because you're in, once you get an approval, even if the tree dies, you can't just say, oh well, we won't have that tree. So, um, but it does become more difficult in terms of enforcement because we don't have someone going around checking every site every year to make sure. The only warranty thing that we have that we, I mean most, project um, most contractors get sort of a warranty on trees um, from um, during the process so they have maybe a one-year warranty or what have you and under the subdivision rules we require that it's sort of by the time subdivisions are constructed it's been that long so you can go back and see if the trees are still there but typically under these projects applicants still need to maintain those trees you know in perpetuity So the second issue is the ADA access on the Memorial Park path, that that's going to be possible. Is there, again, the, the video is long and there are a lot of options for the path, so can you just remind us what the outstanding question is that we have to decide tonight? Um, yeah, so the board, I just said the board sort of left it for the applicant and the um, immediate abutters to sort of figure out what made sense between the both of them. So I think on that um, picture the, at the very southern end of that um, site. So, um, if, if I might just, yeah, 
Yeah. Right up in there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the I, there's been an agreement that um, <coughs> that um, that path on the city park would be um, uh, amenable to both to both parties. Um, so we don't have a design for that. Um, I think from a staff perspective, it's as I mentioned at the last meeting. Either one is fine. They need to make a connection. The only missing link really is um, this doesn't actually go to the project. It sends people on this path. So um, typically, I mean, you need to have a direct connection. So there may this is the sidewalk on the on the nearest unit. So basically, if I lived in this unit and I were anyway in need of assistance or I. Um, had trouble walking except on level surfaces, I'm gonna have to go make a U-turn and come back down here to get up to the street. If I live way up there, it's, you know, you're heading that direction anyway, so it's not too um, uh, much of a problem. But um, I think there's a missing link here from this sidewalk that connects all these units to where they're showing this would come out. Mm -hmm. So I think this, piece needs to be thought through a bit more because this is really setting a really long connection. Whereas if it were coming down this road, it's coming down the driveway anyway and it comes to that central point that splits. Um, Where's Memorial Park there? It's right here. So this is where the fountain oh, is. Right. Um, and there's a path around here and then it, it comes down the grade that way. So is this something that we we'll need to we, I mean, we can't make a decision about this tonight, and then we need to ask that the applicants consider that missing link still and provide an updated Yeah, plan. I mean, I think they, I, I would say that they would have to make that, um, figure out the best way to make that um, connection. Okay. Um, it's... That's a very steep area, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I thought it was relatively flat on that section. Uh, I agree. But you know, if that's yeah. the case, I think you need to know that because sure. it is um, a circuitous route for the cluster. Right. It's on not that. ideal yeah. for, for residents. So we should be able to see something by August by the next meeting. Um, the next meeting. Yes, we will. Okay. We'll work on that. Great. So those two issues plus the stormwater permit, which is. That's, can I ask a question procedurally? Um, so, do we regard the issue of trees as having been voted on and settled, or is it going to come up for discussion again at the next meeting? Well, my understanding is that it would be part of the list of conditions at the next meeting when we go to make a decision. You know that, but that we have had discussion. We have. We're not going to reopen that. That we've come right. to some okay. agreement on that particular issue but you know we're not individually voting on right. certain aspects of the you know of the application but um you know, i suppose if somebody wanted to they could but i think you know we've spent between the last meeting and this meeting i think we've talked through it a good deal and um you know it's more to kind of move us forward so that we don't have to allocate time at the next meeting to going over it so so and just like about that certification thing that i should talk about it is something that it could make sure that they enforce it or it's being enforced since as you suggest kind of a things happen and trees sometimes do not leave that long as expected could we use this this word or this condition about certification through the development or throughout the development to completion or can you work on it or is that something that yeah you i mean i can just are you talking about are you talking about um for a long term, um, the, the longevity of yeah, longevity, the trees, yes. or just that they get planted? From no, I think the longevity, yeah. because now the issue here is that that's our weird vibe, right? Is you want more trees, you want to keep the trees. So if you cannot, because, or if you suggest if you're not requiring more trees, but you want to make sure that whatever you plant, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think at least that you should. You can reinforce try to that in a condition. Bring that up. Right. Yeah, even though it's required. So we could lose. condition, you know, for example, the stormwater system is periodically checked, correct? Like right. that's so following that model that we 
require a periodic check on yeah, the yeah, health yeah. of the trees that have been replaced. I think we can, yeah, we can add that as a condition uh, at the Just next two. meeting. I'm no tree expert, but I think generally if they last a year, in other words, through a full growing and dormant season, mm -hmm. they're pretty much on their way. Yeah, I think we do two years. Two years? Uh, two well, years. And I was going to say the, the analog to the stormwater is a little bit different because that's written that, if I'm not mistaken, that the requirements uh, in the stormwater management bylaws are written that that report gets done in perpetuity. Right. Yeah. But you know, you could also reinforce that you know after to the two-year window uh, um, notice that the, all the plantings are you know have survived, but also if, if they died. No matter when, even after the two years, if they have to replace them. That could be higher. Yeah. Okay. What about if, how long? How long will it take to develop this project? Uh, you have a better sense than I do. We're we're hoping to complete between two and three years. So we could say no CO after two years from commencement of the project. Um, all the trees have to be alive. Um, at least that's a point at which it would be enforceable. Although the issue is not whether or not they're alive. I mean, if they die, they have to be, Right. you know, I mean, the, the plan on paper has to be seen in real life. Right. So it doesn't have to be the same tree, it just has to be a living tree. I can send you draft conditions um, okay. for you to look at um, with those thresholds. I think, I think it'd be good. Yeah. Then at least try to. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. I mean, it's certainly in the developer's interest to ensure they live because it would yeah. be far more expensive to let them die and have to keep replacing them. So there is an, there's a financial incentive to Unless they ensure sold they all live. the units and are moved to, you know, <laughs> Switzerland. <laughs> well, and I'm going to make an assumption about the people who move into co housing that they probably appreciate and want as many trees as they can yeah. to be in their yard so they're not going to. Right. And monkey around and where there have been instances where people will cut down a tree in their yard in order to make room for something else that they've been on the plan so i i would expect to yeah. down the road there are going to be more trees not fewer yeah. on this yeah. site yeah. yeah so we did open uh, this to public comment earlier when we were talking just about that tree issue but i do want to just pre-open and remind folks that if you do have other issues related to this application comments that you'd like to make um, that the floor is open, please come to the podium, state your name and your address. I'll just say that um, your name and address I'm again? Deborah Shifter, I'm at 26 Crescent Street, and I am hoping to be living in this project, and so I just want to, and we have been working really hard for a long time, and we're really anxious to get it going, and it's disappointing to wait for a weekend you know, meeting after meeting after meeting that it's not starting. And so I'm do really hope that it'll pass in two weeks. <laughs> and again, we are waiting on the stormwater permit, which is an incredibly critical part of any development. No, I understand, and that's very important. Yeah. Right. Other comments and concerns, questions, input? We have a full house here. Other than that, I would entertain a motion to continue this. So, 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 so um, you needed time. The ninth um, agenda um, is quite full. Um, we had to advertise already for uh, hearing at seven. You could double up and put this at seven in front of the other one, um, what I think, which would be wise because the other two projects are probably going to be um, have quite robust discussion so um, you um, yeah I mean I would recommend that so I would recommend that you continue it to 7 p.m. and it would just be the first item above the other 7 p.m. advertised and the idea being that at that point you will have circulated the conditions and we all are on the same page at this point so at that point what we're doing is a formal you would hear back the comments from DPW. The hearing's still open, so you'd yeah. be taking the comments in from DPW, yeah. um, reviewing um, draft conditions that I will um, send out beforehand, yeah. and but discussing them, and then making a decision. And the big unknown, I guess, would be the, the trail connection. 
Right. So if that right. were to fall apart, and they say there's no possible way, then we have to talk about that. Right. right. So, so a continuation to August 9th at 7 p.m. Is there a motion for that? So moved. Second. Great. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Hearing is continued to August 9th, uh, 2018 at 7 p.m. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is at 7.30 p.m., a subdivision amendment by Emerson Way LLC, map ID 36-68, to allocate six previously identified affordable units to another site at Emerson Way in Florence. Um, I have a financial connection to Hampshire Property Management, which is a party to Emerson Way LLC um, in the form of a, uh, being a client of Hampshire Property Management, so I'm going to recuse myself from this particular issue. Um, uh, I own units in a condominium association that is represented or managed by Hampshire Property Management, um, which is a part of Emerson Way LLC. Yeah. Uh, so I have a financial connection to them. Uh, I don't think that it would impede my ability to be objective, but I do have a connection to the yeah. So technically, if you do that, you should step down. Okay. Um, which means we need to know that we need to have a show <laughs> No, that was intentional. It wasn't. No. <laughs> it is so good on that. I have a cheat sheet. I have a cheat sheet. No. Okay. Thank you. Carolyn, can you also clarify, this is related to a subdivision, so can Alan and I vote ultimately or not? Um, good question. Um, what, what was the question? Because we're yes. associate so members. members. Yes. Right. Just okay. <laughs> so, um, so, it, so, right. So, as associate members, you cannot vote on the subdivision amendment. So, we need a majority of a quorum present to um, approve. So, one, two, three, that leaves three. You need a unanimous vote. <laughs> so, um, that's um, where we stand. Um, so but we can participate in the discussion. Absolutely. We just can't yeah. at the end. Right. Okay. Right. And so if I step away, I should come back for the other business? Um, yeah, but I have some stuff. Oh, <laughs> there's nothing. There's nothing. OK. So Carol, can I ask a question? Yeah. So does this mean it needs to be a unanimous vote because of the number of people present? Yes. Or Postponed. Yeah, right. So we could postpone to August 9th. Go for it. Go for it. My name is Steve Ferrari. I'm here tonight representing Emerson Way LLC, who is the owner of the Emerson Way subdivision in Florence, Massachusetts. Um, also tonight we have Rich Madowitz, who is a principal in Emerson Way LLC, and Mark Donald, oh he is here, and from Virtue Design Group, and MJ Adams, who has been hired by Emerson Way LLC as a consultant on the affordability issues. So we're here tonight to request an amendment to the uh, subdivision approval of the, or the special permit to transfer six of the eight affordable housing units that were required under the original approval to a city-owned parcel that's located nearby on Brick Spit Road. Uh, we hope to develop a plan for nine small affordable units. And these homes would be built by Plain of Valley Habitat for Humanity on the city-owned site. For the past six months, we've been working with Plain of Valley Habitat, Virtue Design Group, MJR Consultant, and Wayne Feiden to come up with a plan that would be acceptable to Plain of Valley Habitat and that makes sense given the constraints of the parcel on Brisket Road. As a precursor to continuing with this effort, we're re requesting this amendment so that we can uh, have confidence that if we're able to put this deal together with Habitat, we'll be able to transfer six of the eight affordable units to this new site. If the amendment is granted, we plan to work with Virtual Design Group to develop final plans for nine small homes on six lots. Um, 
we will pursue any required approvals from the city, prepare construction budgets for the infrastructure for the development, and then present this uh, development plan to the board at Pioneer Valley Habitat. And if we're able to get the board to accept it, the ultimate goal is for Emerson Way LLC to purchase the six lots from the city, gift those lots to Habitat, um, also make a substantial contribution towards the development costs for the site. Um, I have a few slides to help explain this fairly convoluted and complicated project. Um, so this is a uh, aerial view of the subdivision. It was taken about a month ago. Um, shows the, uh, the status of, of current build out. There are 51 single family lots in the subdivision and four duplex lots. And so far we've built 27 homes and there are another five sites that are uh, either currently under contract or under construction. This is an um, aerial view of the Emerson Way subdivision and really across the street on Burt's Pit Road is a, is a 10 lot parcel that was created as part of a deal uh, whereby the city acquired rights to protect a large area in, um, above the site and uh, in exchange they created this 10 lot piece that could be developed and the city has been trying to um, find developers for that parcel. This is the, uh, a copy of the approved subdivision plan. I think it was from 2003-2004 for the subdivision. We have some more detail. Um, the four lots that are colored here are the duplex lots that were um, set up to be developed as affordable housing units. We do plan to build a duplex on lot 15 and 16 right here, and would hope to transfer the affordable units that would be built on these three lots to the other Burt's Pit Road site. Just to clarify for me, I'm a little confused by your term duplex. It's a double lot or you're going to put well, duplex houses there? The designation on the plan has two lot numbers. It's really a single lot <coughs> that, would hold, that would hold a duplex structure. So there'd be two dwelling units on a single lot number, for instance, 39 and 40. But it's now created as a single one unit, which is a duplex, or two smaller homes? A combined, uh, uh, attached duplex structure. Attached to two residential units in one building. Um, and, excuse me, can I, what, are you, forgive me if you're going on to explain this, but what are you going, what would happen to the four duplex lots if your plan went through? They would become a uh, single family, um, so they would be lots. free of any restriction and Correct. you would sell them for whatever. Right, for whatever we could sell them for. <clears throat> um, this is a, uh, we've actually had the affordable unit designed for some time. We started working on this issue back in 2014. Uh, these are some plans that were developed by Q and Riddle Architects for the duplex unit that we, that we hope to build. Um, it's, there are two two-story units with about 1,300 square feet of space, attached garage, and the lot we've chosen uh, would accommodate a walkout basement, so it would actually be the ability to put another room or two in the, in the, in the basement of the structure. Um, so I think uh, MJ is going to make a quick presentation about the logic for this switch, and I'll be here if anyone has any questions. Hi, I'm MJ Adams, and I've been working with Emerson Way since uh, February of 2014. They brought me on board to start looking at how you put, or how you might think of framing affordability into a mixed use development. We started working on this, like I said, four years ago. Worked with Peg Keller, the housing planner, to really work through the details of the uh, the costing, the affordability, the affordable housing deed writers, and what the structure might look like. We've been um, getting ready to start construction on the first one for a, a while. Uh, we've had the designs in, in hand, and as we've been moving forward and preparing for that, um, the Habitat approached Steve Ferrari to say they were working on the uh, Burt Bog uh, development, and did they know of a developer who might be able to do something around the lots that they were planning that they had received from the city. 
So we started to have more involved conversations with Habitat and started talking about the challenges that both Habitat and any affordable housing development might face in terms of trying to put these units into use and create these units that will work for the long term for the families who would be buying them. And it seemed as if that this was a, a worthy conversation to pursue. And the reason we're here tonight is because um, Habitat uh, is, we've been having conversations with Habitat, but it's, we're at a point where we need to have more thorough and detailed pre-development work done before we enter into a more serious conversation and um, actually seek to finalize this, this transfer should you approve it. The idea would be to transfer the six of the eight affordable units that were originally to be built at Emerson Way over to the, the uh, Birds Bog development. And, and, that, and our commitment is to build two affordable units at Emerson Way. That will stay. And as uh, Steve showed you, we would build the structure that we have designed um, at the, on the green lot. Uh, I think it's lot number uh, 14 and 15. But the rationale is really to think the long term about how to make this sustainable for people who step into home ownership, affordable home ownership, and their finances for the long term, and the sustainability of how they feel in the context of the neighborhood. Um, stepping into a habitat, in, into a neighborhood that has some pretty expensive homes that are already constructed on the site, may be challenges for families who are at or below 80% of the HUD median income. Um, you know, there's the initial house price, but then there's the question of how you might feel living in a neighborhood where you are clearly, or obviously, um, not at the income, same income level as uh, your neighbors. That said, uh, the habitat neighborhood that's happening in this, across the street um, would provide a, an environment that would be probably more comfortable for people who are earning 80 to 80, less than 80 percent of the HUD median income. That's about 65,000 for a family of four, just so you know the numbers. Habitats, um, habitat tends to work at low, a little lower income level in terms of uh, responding to affordability. But there's a sense of how would this work for the long term for the families who step into it. So when Habitat approached Steve and we started to have these conversations, we thought it might be a workable solution for us to take a look at transferring the six of the eight affordable units from um, Emerson Way over to the development that we would do in partnership um, with Habitat, should Habitat decide to move forward on this. There's no, they haven't made a final decision, there's negotiations and discussions going on, but it is not a final deal yet. So what we're looking for tonight is for a contingent uh, consideration from the planning board to allow the transfer of the six units, six affordable units from Emerson Way over to um, the development with Habitat should the Habitat board decide that they want to proceed. And uh, I don't want to speak for Habitat, but um, Habitat clearly is, has been in these conversations with us and we're hopeful that that might work out for the homeowners, for the city, and for the community. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, what is the rationale for moving six of the eight as opposed to all eight? I mean, given the idea that you're proposing that people might not feel comfortable, there are going to be two units still left in the middle of this higher income yeah. development. So why that decision? Because I think that the, the initial goal of this was to have mixed income neighborhoods. Yeah. And we've worked on this, and we don't want to entirely abandon that opportunity at Emerson Way. We think that it's a worthy thing to accomplish. <coughs> um, the, the question is, will people, how will people feel about buying into that development? And I don't know the answer to that. But it's a, it's a valid question. And I think we feel very committed to, you know, the, the original approval was that there would be some level of affordability at Emerson Way. We feel committed to honor that. So if I might, across the street at the new cluster, there's currently room for eight building lots. So six, are we building a, an enclave of low, of affordable housing right there? <coughs> um, I can, let me, if, give me one second and I'll pull up the plan. Good. So 
So um, a lot across the oh, here we go. So this is the parcel on the other side of Grace Pit Road. Um, it was created as a 10 watt piece and um, so far these two parcels have either been purchased by or given to the original property owner. The deal was created basically to, to protect a large amount of conservation land <coughs> above Birds Pit Road. Um, the original owner of uh, Coal Construction Inc. I think received these two lots in exchange for this transaction. This lot has been, is either under contract or has been promised to an individual who plans to build a house here. These two lots that are on Birds Pit Road, um, the city has in, had intended to give these to Habitat to develop a total of three affordable units. Um, and the reason I was approached, I have a long-term relationship with Habitat. In fact, the first time I, uh, I really learned about Habitat was in this room when they came to be a, an obnoxious abutter for a project that was being built right next to me, where a very similar development was happening. The city had acquired back land and was buying front parcel and creating a cluster <coughs> development to get to Habitat. Well, we ended up thinking it was a pretty cool idea and uh, spent the next 12 months every weekend as a volunteer construction supervisor helping get the house built. That's a, a little back, back story. But the, Megan actually called me because the problem with this site is that if you had the habitat development here, surrounded by these six lots and even lots on this side, there, there's a lot of engineering work that has to be done to deal with stormwater. There are easements for utilities. There are driveway easements. And Habitat was concerned that there might be a developer who would not be as friendly to their project as somebody who had a relationship with them. So that's how we came to this idea. And looking at you know, the, the whole parcel, these six, um, these four parcels, uh, combined with the two that Habitat was intending to develop, make it really, um, it's easier to come up with a comprehensive plan for that larger land mass than to try to pigeonhole Habitat into the front piece and then have other people developing the back parcels. So that's kind of the background of how, how we got here. You know, you all received, um, and the applicant received a letter from the housing <coughs> planner for the city of Northampton, Peg Keller. So you have uh, that in your email. Right. Did you all see that? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, raising concerns that um, the transfer then sort of whittles down um, the idea of scattered site housing throughout, um, particularly that subdivision. That was the, and that was the. Goal and the impetus and the um, decision at that time in 2003 was to create the units you know, dispersed. Um, so there's um, uh, that that I just wanted to make sure that people were aware. Can can yeah. I also speak to George's question about uh, an enclave, this affordable uh, low income enclave? Is um, at the end of Garfield Avenue, Habitat built six. affordable uh, units together in a little neighborhood. Uh, up on West Hampton Road, uh, Habitat built six units together in a little neighborhood. That Those have worked out quite well from all observations. Um, I think that when people step into home ownership, um, it's different than um, what we might perceive as projects or apartments, that it's really a very, it becomes a very different type of neighborhood. And so I wouldn't characterize what Habitat might build as a low-income home. I, I, I apologize for the use of word, but I didn't know how else to use that in that they're not, it's not all going to be market rate homes, right. but there will be um, a subsidy to them. So, and, and I take that point um, really well, MJ, and I know you've got a lot of work in this field, but I think the original intent behind <coughs> Emerson Way was to disperse the affordable housing there so that folks can live amidst people who have a different level of income and there's a mixing then and maybe there's a 
you know, it's more philosophical than anything. There's educational patterns that work both ways. People who live in the large homes are now living side by side with people who aren't. Mm -hmm. um, just as many neighborhoods in Northampton are like. Um, so, you know, I, I just think it's a step backwards to move them from the sprinkled effect into this more of a cluster area when there's this opportunity to do it within this larger neighborhood. That's just all. Yeah, I, I've, I'm pretty uncomfortable with it for several reasons. First, I, I think the question that Jenna raised is a good one. If there's somehow something bad or undesirable about having eight housing units in Emerson Way, why is it good to have only two? Um, I would think, if anything, that's worse. Um, that's number one. Number two, I mean, there's something about the belief that people in $500,000 houses can't live near people in affordable housing, that's pretty harsh. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to lecture to anyone, Joanne. The two of you have more experience in this field, certainly, than I do or anyone else in the room does. And I'd be interested in hearing from Joanne and MJ. I mean, you're, <laughs> you, you know, you've worked for Habitat for so many years. Now you're kind of on, seems to me, consulting to undermine what you worked for for all those years. I, I mean, I, I don't understand the moral underpinnings of this position, that we're saying people have to be segregated into upper income housing and middle income housing. That, that obviously is different from what led to the granting of this permit in the first place. I, I have a hard time thinking of a justification for it. Can I speak to that a little? Sure. Um, I think that over the years, as I worked in Habitat, one of the biggest challenges we saw was the whole issue around the condo, um, mm -hmm. managing condo associations, and putting people, low-income people, uh, into financial, legal, and neighborhood response, you know, relationships with each other that were complicated. And that does inform my, my point of view in terms of what kind of housing are we building that is affordable to first-time home buyers. And I, I believe that, I mean, I'm standing here because I believe that what Habitat can offer is closer and more manageable and more desirable for people to feel like they're owners of single family homes than what they might find that we would build at Emerson Way. I mean, you're saying that they would, on a personal day-to-day -day level, feel uncomfortable living in a neighborhood of very high-end houses. I think, I, I think it's naive of us sometimes to think that that works out as smoothly as we'd like to yeah. believe it would. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't want to be Pollyannish, I'm not, but <coughs> is that basically what we're saying? No, that we're, people I, will feel more comfortable with neighbors of their own income level? I think we're talking about the, the, the financial relationship that these homeowners will be in at the Emerson Way development, where they'll be part of a homeowners association that is responsible for carrying the cost of a private road maintenance and plowing. That there will be um, challenges that will come down the road that might stretch it and make it financially difficult for the homeowners, the affordable homeowners, to, to feel comfortable in that neighborhood. I just wonder if that was not, why wasn't that thought in the beginning when the whole that we had to cost of maintaining the uh, other for the low for the housing. I'm sorry, this eight one one of the project was approved and that. I think the idea of a mixed income housing is a very noble one and a very laudable one. Um, I think the, the practical realities of achieving that so that it works well for especially for the the folks who are at the lower end of the income spectrum um, is, is something that we have to be mindful 
the, just around so the homeowners association have these extra fees because that's a private way much like a condo fees I think what I'm hearing so that it's the the affordable housing kind of ratio kick into that to their portion of what they um, put into their homeowners association fee too on a monthly or annual basis do they pay a hundred percent do they pay that 65 percent do they pay that 45 percent I don't know technically the answer to that okay Perhaps. so Rich, can you answer that presumably it would be shared by their neighbor I mean it would be one fee divided two ways presumably yes. wouldn't that be a shared interest by the size of the value of the house I live in a condo and we pay shared interest I mean right. And that's sometimes, on the size sometimes that's calculated on the the, the, um, the square footage of the unit that you have. Yeah, that's my yeah, case. But that's in a, I don't think that would be the case here because these are private builders. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be divided per lot. And then if there's a duplex, presumably it would be divided a half for each owner of, of the du a duplex. So it would be smaller. I'd be interested in Joanne would care to express her thoughts on the issue? What's that? So, Joanne, Joanne, Joanne. I'm Joanne Campbell, Valley Community Development, so I am here to speak. I um, have some concerns about this request. Um, you know, it it's, was approved 15 years ago, and, you know, not one unit has been built. And, you know, I sort of was trying to think of some positive things, like at least if a, if a couple of units had been built over time, and then the developer came and felt that there were some things that were happening that prevented him from moving forward, but this has been going on. I mean, I talked to Doug Cole when this first was approved, so, you know, that, that rubs me wrong. I think, you know, it's a requirement of the permit that um, they got some sort of zoning relief or some agreement that was made back then um, I, I agree with Alan's question, what happens to those lots? Now they become market rate units as well, so there's more, again, more income, you know, more profit for the developer that was supposed to build. Um, I do want to make the point that, you know, any future projects I would suggest that the planning board do, that phase them in, so if there was affordable units and market units, that for every so many market units, an affordable housing had to be built so we wouldn't be here 15 years later with, I think there's a 27 units and five units in construction. Um, I think also the habitat model is, you know, self-built. Don't think there's a lot of folks, you know, who are necessarily interested in that and what I believe the affordable units in Emerson Way would probably be serving people probably between 60 and 80 percent of the median income. Habitat serves people at 60 percent or less. So it's a different market than what was originally planned. Um, obviously we do home ownership counseling and um, whether it was 15 years ago or today there is such a backlog of people who want to buy affordable, you know, who want to buy a home who make 80% or less and they are in a desperate mode with prices constantly escalating. And in 2003, 2005, before the bubble burst, I mean, it's just, I, you know, losing these units um, to me is, is, um, is tragic. I, this, the issue of, you know, will the folks fit in there it really rubs me wrong as well. Are there class issues? Aren't we trying to try to work around getting people to know people of different income levels? And what is your life like? What is my life like? And to make it sound like these folks should be moved somewhere else just really um, makes me feel bad. The Ice Pond is a mixed income development. Have there been some class issues there? Yeah, they had to work them out. But it just, it just makes me feel really uncomfortable. And I'm not quite sure if it's a financial reason why aren't the units being built there. That sort of hasn't been raised tonight about why are they being moved off? Is it simply because the families won't fit or is it a financial that the developer hasn't figured out a way 
financially to build these homes there. Um, the other thing, just looking at the four lots, it, like, to me it looked like the smallest lot was the lot they were giving to the two families in Emerson Way. So the other larger lots, they looked larger to me. So these are my comments. Um, so. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. The median income home that we're speaking of on Emerson Way, if they get transferred to this Burt's box, they no longer become uh, affordable housing. They now become part of another entity, uh, Habitat. So they're serving two different types of buyers. Is that true or not true? I don't guess I'm. Um, so just I want to make sure I understand your question. So if the units that are required to be built by Emerson White LLC are sort of transferred physically to another location, <coughs> they would still, so long as they still meet the, the build the number that they were supposed to build, it doesn't really matter so much the entity because our, our um, uh, definition of affordability d isn't then tiered. Um, we have one threshold, it's 80% or below area median income. So, we don't look at the tiers between you know 20 and 80 or 30 percent and 80 percent. So um, that's just sort of um, a target, I guess, that um, the either Habitat or Valley CDC look at and try to meet, and also federal guidelines about different um, um, financial responsibilities or op um, opportunities there are for um, building affordable units. If it meets the 80 percent or lower threshold, that meets the zoning. On an income base, 80% or lower. Yeah, that's okay. area median. And what is our area median, Jim? <laughs> just sorry, um, it's fine, I'm just trying to. I would have to turn to one of these two <laughs> folks um, to know what the current number is. I mean, it changed, they, well, they adjust it. Um, I would think, is it around 55? It's about no, no. 64 for a family of four. Okay, yeah, 64 for family. For a family of four, so they do it a different um, family um, size too. But so for a family of four, so if they stay at Emerson Way, it doesn't go to Habitat. Habitat, as I understand, Joanne, you just said uh, that's a, uh, and I think I've seen on television that you're you're putting some sweat equity into this property in order to purchase this property, correct? Yeah. But if it stays at Emerson Way, that's not how this is going to go. Um, and that's up to the. I, I mean. Certainly the property owner can um, negotiate that, but it's really up to the property owner to figure out how that's managed. As long as they turn out to be affordable. Right, right, as long as they meet that criteria. Um, so the other um, question that, um, I, you know, there are um, certainly issues about the homeowners association and the responsibilities in perpetuity for the street and the um, infrastructure. There are also um, requirements at Bird's Bog for the same thing. In fact, the stormwater is even more tenuous there. DPW noted some concerns about expanding the, the total number of the total footprint because the stormwater um, engineer there was um, is very complicated. Um, so there would also be an association responsibilities for maintaining and perpetuity infrastructure of that site. Um, certainly not as big of a road, but it's also spread across more units and versus less units. Carolyn, can you describe a little bit more in your memo you suggested that one of the benefits of allowing this would be that this kind of, and they reference this as well, that this would sort of enable all of these lots to be developed together in a way that would be complicated otherwise. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the stormwater piece is that these are individual lots. Currently, um, sort of the, um, the idea was there'd be shared driveway. So um, those um, sort of uh, rectangle, skinny rectangles represent, um, I think that's what's showing the easements for the shared driveways. Um, so, there's that piece, but also because the stormwater so is um, it, the stormwater is really 
um, permit was issued for the common land of development. So there's an order in which the units have to be built in order to comply with the way the stormwater system was engineered. So that's one piece. Um, currently, and that can be amended for sure if a different mechanism um, for addressing stormwater can be made. But so those would all, the way it's um, laid out is they would all be 10 individual um, lots with 10 owners. And then the folks that were sharing driveways would just have their driveway piece um, shared between one or two lots, depending on um, how many. Um, and uh, but the the so that's how the that's how the plan was approved. Um, with ten plan. separate building owners. That was that was the idea. There's ten separate owners for each of those lots. This plan came before the planning board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a cluster. And preserving permanently the open space. And, okay, and there was no conditions around affordable housing at that point on that plan? Yeah. No, 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 no. So the city is just trying to find an investor, more or less, or a, a developer to help build this out now because they don't have. So we issued, so, right, there's the idea was that we. To offset, as we, do, we call it a limited development project, to offset the acquisition of the open space for the city, um, um, we carved out building lots. And then the idea would be to sell the building lots to um, you know, pay back that, that um, partial cost of the overall um, acquisition of the open space. Question about the permit that was granted for Emerson Way. It so as has been referred to, it's 15 years, and none of the units have been none of the affordable units have been built. Is there any to, by which the city could require that they be built? I mean, what if what if the they just develop all the other units in the subdivision and never build the affordable ones? Um, well, I mean, the short answer would be they'd be in violation of their permits. However, as part of subdivision, there's a financial performance guarantee that's in place. Oh, so that so that's another mechanism that, um, and, and so at various times they've come to the board asking for a change in that amount. Um, and the topic of, when, you know, the question of when are the units going to be under construction has come up at various times when they've come back to the board. But they've, you, you know, I think the last time they came, they showed that they were working on these design plans that you saw tonight for the duplex. Um, 2014. Yeah, I don't remember if that was the last time they amended the, the um, performance guarantee. But. Could someone clarify for, for at least me again? What is what is happening on the one affordable lot that is being dealt with, or is that under construction, or what did you say? Um, no, actually, I, I'd like to step back a bit because I really am the instigator of this whole thing. And um, even though I built houses in Emerson Way and work for Rich, I really have no financial shoe in this. Um, this happened because I got a call from. Megan McConnell, executive director of Planning and Valley Habitat. We've been, as uh, agent of the developer, we've been trying since 2014 to come up with plans for an affordable unit, to budget it, and figure out how we can build it. Also, as a, as a point of reference, construction didn't start in the subdivision, even though the first phase of the road was in. The first house wasn't built until 2010, maybe, I think it was 2010? 2011, yeah. So this is this was a subdivision that sat idle for a long time for many reasons. Um, acknowledging the problems we have, and granted, it's a financial hardship to build these units because they're going to cost more than we can sell them for. That's the economic reality. We're going to build something there that is fitting to the style of home that's in the neighborhood. If you look at median income compared to housing costs in 2010 when the subdivision was approved. Look at that figure today. The spread is incredible. I, I'm seriously considering getting out of the home building business because prices are crazy. So 
again, the, the reason we're here is because there was this odd confluence of people who had a relationship to Habitat, the city who had a parcel that needed to be developed, and I really thought there was an opportunity, a unique opportunity, to get to Habitat a substantial contribution that would help them achieve their goal of building affordable housing. When you step back and look at it, the total, the total gift that might end up being given to Habitat is close to a quarter of a million dollars. And that's driven by a bunch of factors, not all altruistic, but just a reflection of the reality of I'm sorry, what, close to what figure? A quarter of a million dollars. And, you know, so that's, that's really why we're here, because I was trying to drive the bus, considering that this was a, a unique opportunity to put together a bunch of players who otherwise wouldn't be in the same world. At so the same time, time, I'm sorry, isn't it also true that freeing up those three lots well, I mean, part sure. of our shouldn't get into anyone's business, financial, how much money they're going to make on this or that, but it's well known the lots sell for $125,000 each. So that'll free up $375,000 of saleable lots. Mm -hmm. Part of that money is going to finance, you know, part of that money goes to finance the sale. But the, what, the original question, Alan, was about... Well, what's happening to... I, I thought some, MJ may have said there's one lot that's being built on now. Yeah, we chose lot 14 and 15. Mostly, it is the smallest lot. It actually is a small lot because land behind the lot was gifted to the city as part of the open space plan. But we chose that lot because it has topography that lets you build a walkout basement which is the cheapest way to build additional space. So it's a way to get more value out of that house and still make it affordable. And that's why we chose that. So that one is under construction? We have the plans for it. We're planning to start. Oh, it should it. start? Yeah. And then that will be offered at a price that will satisfy, that will satisfy the affordability requirement. That would be 225000 per unit. Yes. And that's without any relationship to habitat for your manager. No relationship no. to habitat using the affordable first time home buyer mortgage program products. And I also have to say that Emerson it's a great neighborhood. I mean I have clients there who when I expressed to them what we're planning to do, they said, No, we want the affordable units here. So it's a complicated issue, you know, it's uh, there are economic realities, there are social realities. It's just, uh, I really saw this as a unique opportunity to make something happen that would work all around. And it, it just, it's a tough deal and it would not work. So the units, the affordable units are going to be built either way, right? They have to be either in the initial development or moved across the way. Um, but in the one case, Habitat and the city benefits, but the developer also benefits because they're free up and then have some extra profit and you know, we don't have as much of a mixed income, direct mixed income in the neighborhood. Okay. Right. So the main issue is, is, is cluster below income, right? Affordable housing. That would be the main issue. Yeah. It's not even low income. I mean, oh, the it should be accurate. Yeah. What, middle income or I'm not sure what the term is. And if I go home, well, workforce housing? Yeah. Well, it's not it's even not workforce housing. No. It's even support low income. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Do we have to open up for more public comment? Is it already open? Yeah, you opened it up, but you oh, yeah, oh, make sure. Am I supposed to do it? Well, somebody needs to recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, should you open? Yeah. I thought everybody was already talking about it, but uh, you can, can you open for the for the public to make your comments or in additional comments on, on top of what your kind of our concerns is about, maybe? Okay, please. My name is Don Petrosi, and I live at Seven Nine Eight Bristol Road. Uh, MJ, I think, reflected what I, I feel that if this is approved, that we're setting a precedence for any other contractor to come in 
to the city and say, I'm going to build so many houses on these lots and that he's required to build so many affordable housing lots. So all of a sudden, like after 15 years, 10 years, he decides, oh, I'm making big bucks on, on these units I'm building and maybe I can work a deal with the city or someone else to give it to affordable housing, which I'm not opposed against, but I think that it might be setting a precedence. So that's what I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please come. I'm <coughs> uh, uh, Roswell Ager. I live on Emerson Way, and I was very aware um, when my wife and I looked at lots that there were going to be a certain number of affordable housing units built at some point. That was a selling point for me. Um, I think, frankly, one of the things that Emerson Way is now missing, which isn't very much, but it's precisely what's about to perhaps go, namely affordable housing, uh, I think of the word diversity. I think of the idea of a neighborhood as being complex, varied, uh, and um, not homogenized. And I, I, I worry about the loss of what I had assumed were going to be X number of units of affordable housing because of the quality of the neighborhood, which is high. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not malcontent, not by any means. Um, I'm a little concerned also by the uh, hearing the possibility that decisions might be made for other people, namely uh, the assumption that people who need to find affordable housing won't make intelligent decisions about things like homeowners associations and so forth. Um, I think that, you know, we all make good decisions and we all make bad decisions and it's not necessarily income driven. Um, not having a lot of money doesn't make you stupid. Um, so that's my comment. Thank you. Anzalaki, I live on 788 Birds Pit Road. This is a little intimidating for me, so pardon me. Um, so we just, we're all friends. <laughs> <friend. laughs> uh, oh, don't worry. Uh, we met, it was probably over a year ago, I believe, with Wayne, I think, from the Planning Commission, where initially we were talking about the 10 lots that it's definitely across the street from where I am. And what was described was <coughs> what is currently under plan, the current plans on Emerson Way would be mixed income. And so it's a little unsettling to see. We were, um, he was talking about three, he was calling them affordable units, single family homes, and then other, um, I don't know what the right term is, current market value homes. So that was presented to us a year ago. Seems like what was planned for Emerson Way. So you'd have two separate areas with the same type of environment, which, and I'm not an expert on housing or, or whatever, but you know, I, I share this gentleman's hope that the diversity and the inclusion would be, you know, sure, there's always gonna be bumps in the road, but it really offers a lot of opportunity. And that's in this area, it seems like that's, what we're striving for. So I just wanted to share what we had heard about a year ago from what those the plans were for those 10 units, those 10 lots. And that's and I haven't heard anything since I got the, the notice to come tonight. So I just wanted to share that. I'm Rich Matowitz. I'm uh, one of the developers of uh, Emerson Way. Uh, I'd like to say a few things. Uh, first of all, I heard your comments very loud and clear, and uh, we're sort of in the pregame here. We're hoping that uh, we'll get approval uh, to transfer those lots, and we're hoping that Habitat will eventually agree to a development. We know we have to work with the uh, neighbors and uh, 
it's hard to work on a development when you don't know if it's going to be a viable situation, which is why we're here today. It's almost like the pregame. The season hasn't started. If we get approval here, we'll talk to Habitat. We'll work with their board, and we'll see if we can come up with a uh, development plan. And we'll also have setbacks and landscaping, and we're very interested in addressing the concerns of the neighborhood and the neighbors across the street. So I don't want you to think that there hasn't been any thought related to you guys. We haven't met, but we've certainly thought about that piece. Um, the genesis of why I'm here uh, to some extent is Wayne called me and said, would you take on another subdivision development and introduce Burke's Park? And I said that I really didn't have an interest in that. And then we started percolating and Steve uh, was approached by Megan. And the real genesis of the whole um, three-party arrangement is economic. And let me explain how this works and why we think it might be a benefit to all parties. Um, Alan's correct that we have uh, an economic gain and in fact we'll have three lots uh, to sell. Although those three lots, we have plenty of inventory so those additional revenue dollars will be added to the subdivision. So when we look at that additional revenue, um, we are effectively transferring that. We are, uh, have agreed uh, to make a minimum of a quarter million dollar donation to Habitat. That will go to the Birds 5 development. It will, it will include land purchase. It will include our development skills in terms of pre-development work. It will leave whatever's remaining in a pot of money for site work, and it can jumpstart the uh, development. I, I think that that may be one of the larger donations that the Habitat's ever received. And it appealed to them on the sense of um, having land, pre-development pre work, and an additional pot of money for site costs, which seemed pretty advantageous. On our side, despite what the perception is we're 15 years into the development and Emerson Way is not going to be a profitable deal. Um, and if anybody has any questions or would like to audit it, uh, I'll pay for the audit if somebody wants to conclude that it's going to be a profitable deal. It's not. Just too many years, too much carry. We, we've almost paid a million dollars in real estate taxes. So having said that, it's important to understand our economics, which are really um, far different than in 2003. So there, there's two levels, two sort of parts to the seesaw. On the affordable housing end, there's the household income, which sets the sales price. And in the last 15 years, household income has been pretty stagnant. I think that that's widely understood. And household income has gone up about 20% in those 15 years. These are approximations, they're not exact. But construction costs have nearly doubled, especially in the last year, we've seen a real escalation in costs. So that seesaw is that we now get 20% additional sales revenue, but we have 100% additional construction costs. And so you have a project that's underwater, and with those four affordable housing units, it really becomes way underwater. So for our own self-interest, we're searching for a way of relieving ourselves of something that's not just a little bit de de debilitating, it's hugely debilitating. So what we would like is to get approval to talk to Habitat, because that's all we're doing right now. This project is going to be dropped through my Habitat. It has to be approved by Habitat. We've already committed to make a minimum of a $250,000 donation. If we're successful, the city will be able to sell the land by year end. Habitat will have a nine single family home development, which is probably more attractive than, than, than these duplexes and a nicer living style. Um, and Emerson Way is transferring a, a, a fairly significant financial liability. So for those reasons, we look at this as a possible win for the city and being able to sell the land relatively quickly a possible win for Habitat if, if the board approves the uh, land development. And for Emerson Way, a transfer of liabilities, not that we're getting off scot-free, a $250,000 contribution is a pretty significant number. And that number could change and could go up, but that's our minimum. Okay. Okay, thank you. 
Anybody else? Can I, uh, Mr. Manowitz, I uh, just want to. Do I ask a question? Yeah. Thank okay. you. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I certainly am not going to audit your books, or and nor does the planning board, I think, have any business figuring out whether you're making money or not. Hopefully you are. But you also have to acknowledge that the value of those lots in 15 years has gone up. I'm sure they didn't start out at $120,000 per lot. Um, so the the fact that the building costs have gone up and unfortunately the income of the middle class has not, it isn't the whole story. Alan, we don't expect to derive any sales dollars from building the affordable lots, but because that seesaw is tipped so much, we not only do not derive any land value from those four lots, we'll end up with a fairly large loss. Oh, so, right. so you won't be selling the lots, that's right. So, right. you know, if this was 2003 and we had the same economic uh, mm -hmm. equation, right. these four duplex lots would be already built. Yeah, okay. It's that significant a shift. Do we, and comments? Do we do the math on the lots again? There's currently eight vacant lots that were named as affordable. Uh, on Emerson Way? Oh, four with two. Four with two years. Okay, so two one years. is being built on. Right. So this, all three <coughs> other, all of the remaining three would then be moved across the street. Okay. So there would be none other than what's being built. Right. Which, as Jenna pointed out, <laughs> makes yeah. them feel pretty special. Yeah. So, the, the move here is just to, for us to approve, you know, how to have that. That's what the gentleman says. So what's in what front of you idea? is to um, uh, question about whether or not to amend the subdivision permit to allow just um, essentially instead of eight units, two units of affordable housing at the subdivision. Um, what happens next would be on their side to determine whether or not they can make it work. Um, the nine units that they're talking about at Burt's Bug would require an amendment of that permit in front of the planning board to get nine, because nine weren't approved in that, in those um, four lots. So, or uh, um, six lots, I guess. Um, so, that, but that's a different that's a different question. So, tonight, so you and then, but if you were to approve that modification, I would certainly recommend conditions that state you know give a um, uh, tie back so that those units get built before the last six lots or I guess um, three lots get sold at Emerson Way for sure. I join um, suggest that, but the requirement right there. Yeah, but it's a little bit different because now you're sh you're shifting the lots somewhere else. You want to make sure that you know if s something falls apart in that somewhere else, that there's still ample opportunity to come back to the Emerson Way subdivision and build those lots. So it's not uh, just. Um, I think if you approve the request, it should be approved with a condition about reserving lots in the subdivision. So that you can be assured that those that those affordable units get built. Yeah. Otherwise, there could be a scenario where the developer would be freed from the obligation to build the affordable units, and they would just never get built across the street. Maybe, and I mean here, Habitat, which is presumably the recipient of these isn't even here, um, so we don't know what their position is. <laughs> Maybe $250,000 isn't the right number. Maybe Habitat will end up negotiating for three hundred and fifty. dollars So I don't know that we want to approve yeah. anything. Well, I don't know that you need to approve whatever that number is. I mean, that's right. a, and I think you heard from um, the applicants um, that 
the board, Habitat Board hasn't voted on this scenario anyway. So what they're, so because there's a transfer here and there are multiple steps involved, this is the first step. So to even see if it's feasible to do all those units um, at the other site across the way of Burt's Bug, <laughs> the um, developer here has to be assured that the board approves moving those. So this is really step one. And so, you know, it may be that step one happens and that negotiations fall apart between Habitat and um, Emerson Way LLC. So that's why you need to have a condition that states that if that happens, if anything happens where those units aren't going to be built um, across the way, that they return essentially to um, well, or, or as you said earlier, they couldn't get a release of the covenant <coughs> or a release of the last six slots. Right, but I want you, you would want to be clear about what that, what that um, mechanism is. So I think there's some questions if you want to. Oh, is so, that part of the agreement? I thought this whole thing was being proposed was conditional on them moving forward with Habitat and that nothing would happen if they did. That's correct. Um, so, um, can you state your name and address for the sure. record, please? Sure. John Kelly, 66 Emerson Way. Okay. Just my reading of the thing that was proposed. Good. The paper you have come up. Sure. Please. It seems like the paper you have in front of you said that what exactly what you were just saying that if they couldn't come to terms with Habitat, then nothing would happen. Right. It's still um, they're proposing um, that in the application, but I think your decision should still be conditioned upon that. Um, and with, I mean, it's typical that you have um, sort of a check to make sure that that happens and that reinforces their obligation. So and there would have to be some kind of time frame put to that because, again, those negotiations, the build out of bonds, the final agreements, the stormwater decision could be years down the road. And meanwhile, they would be um, Emerson Way could continue to build other homes on the lots, not necessarily on these three places, but still continue moving right along as they are. Um, um, the other so. difficulty, I think, that is, is so even if the negotiation is made, and which is why I think um, tying it some contingency is that um, okay, um, habitat doesn't build quickly necessarily. I mean, the Garfield lots were um, four lots or so. That that whole process took 15 years in and of itself. So through that timeline, you know, their, their, their negotiation may happen, they agree to build the units, but you may not see the units because of just the, the model that they, that they use, which um, is fine, except that in that time period, Emerson Way is completed, and then if something happens, then to whatever, um, you know, we wouldn't hope that, for, of course, but you never know what will happen over that period of time. So that's another reason to sort of make sure not only that the, that the, that the agreement gets struck, but also that there's construction underway. Okay. So one, one more question in the back here. Oh, please, if you don't mind. No, I don't. So really what we're asking for is we're asking to have the ability to talk to Habitat and see if we can make a deal happen and then present a real plan to you. But what you just suggested is not legally viable in terms of Emerson Way. Once we transfer the and give the land to Habitat, we have no control over the time or when things get built. We do have control over the, the one duplex that Emerson Way owns, and we will commit to start that in the second half of uh, this year, and we will commit to finishing that in the first half of next year. But the idea that we can control the subdivision after we've sold the land is uh, a legally insurmountable thing for us to, to have this restriction. It's totally out of our control. Thank you for your time. So, <clears throat> is there another? Anthony, please. Mm -hmm. One more. Um, 
one quick comment that I neglected to mention. A group that seems to have gotten lost in the mix here when we met last year, um, when it was presented to, to us at uh, Ryan Road School, was that the target group, and Habitat was in the mix from the beginning as an option, um, but the target group that they were looking at, hoping to bring into the area, were teachers, firefighters, entry-level professionals, because they can't afford homes um, in the city right now. And that group seems to have gotten lost in the mix. And I don't know, you know, you know, Habitat, I um, you know, low in incomes, but I don't know what these entry-level professionals make, but that, I haven't heard that in the discussion, but um, I just wanted to, to make sure that that was um, also on the table, that that was the vision as of last year to try and attract more folks and, and for affordable um, homes for these entry-level professionals. Uh, anybody else? So, what we... I'm not sure that I, well, I guess I can't even vote, um, but I, I don't know, I mean, there's so many, it's such a complicated yeah. transaction, and with the unknown of the status of the dealings between Habitat and Emerson LLC, um, I think there's a lot of questions. Yeah. I, I'm not, would it make sense to tell them to come back when, when Can I just say one last thing if you don't mind? Sure, please. Yeah. This is kind of like the cart and the horse. So really what we're asking for is allow us to park the habitat, allow us the ability to transfer. What we're really saying is that there's a lot of free development work. We've got to satisfy habitat. We've got to come up with the development that works for them. We're not sure if we can do that, but let's suppose that we can do that. That's going to take uh, a fairly hefty bit of pre-development work, and, and it's expensive. We don't want to go ahead with that unless we know that you guys will approve the transfer. If you approve the transfer, it just allows us to present something if we're able to agree to something with habitat. And you guys get the right to say yay or nay, but allow us to go forward with Habitat and see if we can make any uh, viable development. And you guys can decide later down the line, does this make sense or doesn't it make the sense? But right now, we're going to spend twenty-five or 50000 in pre-development work. And we don't want to do that unless we know that you guys are willing to take a look at this development after it's completed. So really, all we're asking you to do is allow us to transfer and then we go back and you guys can decide does this make sense or doesn't it make sense but to your I, earlier point i thought if if once right. you've transferred it then we don't yeah. actually we don't, have control we don't get it. another bite of the apple no, you know, but, but what i'm saying is that well, i understand what your point is what we're saying is that if we are able to come up with a habitat development that you approve the timing of the habitat building we can't speak to. But what we can speak to is that we've created a, a, an environment where habitat has a situation that we think is somewhat unique. And I believe it's the largest donation they've ever received in their history. So we're not trying to walk away scot-free, but we don't want to spend twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars in pre-development work and end up in a meeting like this where you, you guys say, well, we don't really want to transfer it. What we want to, what we want to do is we want to come back to the board and with, with definitive plans and let you vote yay or nay at that time. A definitive plan for bogs, whatever, across the street. Right, right. That would be the plan. Right. You have full, full domain over, over what would be a future development. So, but, but not, not, not the cost of it. Would, we couldn't read. How could we control whether it's affordable? Uh, you, it would have to be, you wouldn't be worried about the cost. You'd be concerned about okay. making well, sure, sure that it's um, affordable to buy. Yeah, established yeah. as an affordable unit. Um, but that, since that's a different parcel of land, how could we impose a restriction on Emerson Way? So presuming that 
it's habitat, They're, that's what they build. <laughs> that's the only thing they do. So that will meet that criteria. Um, so we could theoretically allow this with a restriction that it be, that it, that the units be transferred to habitat and that they would build. I don't know how that's enforceable. Um, so that um, the units could be transferred to the project across the way. So six units, minimally. Um, and what if the transfer never occurs or never gets built, never ever? Right. So that's where that's where the um, time limit would or or, or some tie back to the final build out of Emerson Way. I mean, presumably that de pre development would be taking place in the net in the coming, you know, zero to twelve months. Um, at which point they're not going to have been able to sell all the remaining lots anyway. Um, so unless I'm not understanding their timeline, and um, you know, you might want to check in with with Rich again about that. But tying it to, you know, the transfer of land to habitat as proposed could be tied, you know, if that falls apart, you could have that as, um, you know, that's the threshold that they have to transfer to habitat as they proposed as opposed to constructing them. It still is not a guarantee that they're going to be built because something could happen, but they're in habitat's portfolio. And if that doesn't take place, they're certain number of lots in Emerson Way would be... It would revert would be, back to those lots, yeah. but you could hold back, you know, you could even hold back those affordable lots for the time, until the time at which um, yeah. they yeah. negotiated the contract with Habitat. And the, and the land was transferred. I mean, the, no, not the land. That, uh, how would we... An enforceable contract with Habitat. Right, really, so you can see proof of a contract with Habitat to release the affordable lots at Emerson. Sure. Yeah, the only transfer to Habitat is money. There's a, oh, well, not even that. No, no it, it's not. It, maybe it's development, development work. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> because Habitat wouldn't take on those lots anyway unless they saw that they could build on them. Right. So if they if they don't and they can't afford to pay for an engineer to redesign those lots um, for them. So that all that work uh, presumably would have to be done before Habitat would take um, take those lots down, draw down those lots. So if we approve this, then it would still be contingent on Habitat deciding that they brought it in. As long as you specify that in your condition. I mean and yeah, you'd have to specify that you want proof that they've taken um, um, ownership before you release those, um, either some number of lots or the duplex lots in particular. It would require certification or something to that effect on a Yeah. And that they were, they had resolved the issues and were taking credit. Right, and you would also see, because the, that plan has to come back to you, you would see that in progress, essentially, because they they would have to amend the plan to do nine units as pitched here would require an amendment of that plan. Can we play out that timeline for a minute? Just so, okay, so they say, we say in theory, if Habitat wants it, and we put in all the necessary conditions, then this can happen. And then Habitat says, yes, we want it. And so the transfer happens. And then they prove the transfer happens. They That's the proof to show that they've met the, con that Emerson Way LLC has met the conditions in this amendment. And then Habitat would come back to us for an amendment of the plan to no, allow. No, you would see that, that first. Would, that would happen before, okay. Right, that was because they would Presumably, Habitat's not going to sign on the dotted line until they know they can build out what they've been promised to be okay. able to build out. So the transfer wouldn't the transfer wouldn't happen until we had approved 
that this was actually viable. That doesn't guarantee that the right. building would actually happen, right. but the transfer would happen once we decided that it could happen. Actually, we don't, the, there wouldn't be a transfer, there would just be a release of that yeah. condition and that permit, and that would presumably lead to a transfer of the, oh no, it wouldn't even be. Well, it is a transfer of transfer land because <laughs> it's transfer of land. We put an RFP out on the street. Um, Emerson Way LLC, I think, is the entity that responded to the RFP. Um, so they have um, put in a proposal to purchase lots at Birdsbog. So they'll, they, if all of that works out, then Emerson Way would have ownership of those lots. And then that's what would be transferred to Habitat ultimately. Or they could assign that right to purchase to Habitat? Um, um, I don't know. That's not the way the RFP. Well, they're very specific the way they responded to the RFP. So they'd have to meet the criteria in the RFP in the response. So there would be a transfer and a release of the yeah. Do you have an additional so I, I'm sorry, I didn't say. You know, I, I think Alan raises a point that I think we, we are willing to agree to. We, we can't control when Habitat builds, but we can restrict those last three duplex lots and put some sort of covenant that says that as Habitat builds, those get released, if that would provide the planning uh, order with more comfort. I'm not sure that accomplishes a lot, because Habitat's in the business of building, but we would be fine with a restriction like that. So, um, the, you know, Emerson LLC has made a wonderful overture and a, a proposal to the city and to Habitat and to that area of helping to subsidize the, the creation of these. Um, But it's not like they're the only game in town. The vibes just kind of opened up. There could be other, and I, and I don't know what other developers have come through the city to ask about that and how many other suitors are out there to build on that land. But it seems to be early in the game to say that they are the only game in town for this lot. And our, if we miss this opportunity, that land's gonna lie fallow and we're not gonna, Habitat won't have a chance to build there in another fashion with other partners. I think we're missing, we're, we're putting all of our eggs and our, our cart and our hearts across the street now instead of dealing with the issue of what do we do about the loss of affordable housing lots in Emerson Way, which is a very big neighborhood, much bigger than Fox, and they don't have any affordable housing lots instead of that one that is currently being built. And I know we can't go back to 2003 and change the conditions of the affordable housing to phase them in. And put any fire beneath Emerson LLC to build those lots in the next three years or the next five years. But, you know, they, they, those lots are always going to be in perpetuity affordable housing. Um, and I hope at some point, whether it's a change in the economy or the change in whatever, that they might be built out at some point as affordable housing. And somebody else may come along to work out a deal with the city or with Habitat to build affordable housing across the street. I don't know why we're rushing to make this transfer at this point in time. I don't, I, don't, I would just say that, it, you know, the, and this point was raised by the applicant um, previously, is that um, these 10 lots are tied together by this infrastructure plan that's complicated. So the more, individual separate entities that are involved in building out, it does make it more complicated, which I think has been a deterrent for people to offer purchase of those lots. So there is definitely a benefit to create, to having a, sort of a master developer building them all out at once. You're right that, um, you know, potentially some other master developer could come along, but I know that um, you know, it has been complicated by the fact that um, there's a <coughs> state, the way the engineering was done for the site um, requires that there be a specific phasing of the build out of the lots. So um, 
that has been a little bit of an impediment. Is it meaningful that habitat isn't here? They uh, they are not here on purpose. I think it's just it was a conflict in the schedule. They are not not here. On purpose. Um, I mean, uh, have you heard from them? Yes. I mean, y yes. They're part of this conversation. And I can speak it too. I mean, in fact. Uh, Habitat doesn't have enough information to make an informed decision. The issue has been discussed. How can we? Because we're just asking for the preliminary step. We're not asking for approval. Well, that's not true, though. You're asking for us to approve your application. Contingent, contingent upon us being able to craft the legal help. And if that is unable to, if that deal falls through, stipulated time frame, then that approval's name since it's conditioned upon the, the deal it doesn't have. And part of the problem is that we, you know, in order to give them reasonable, their decision is based on economics, on how quickly they can build out the project. We need to give them that information. We can't get the information. We can't go ahead and spend that money to get the information that Habitat needs unless we have some reasonable expectation that ultimately that there is reason to do And, and just so there is, a, there is a distinction as well. Just because you say, from a policy perspective, conceptually you're okay with moving the units doesn't, doesn't mean you have to approve the development layout when it comes forward, the amendment to that plan for Burt's Bog. There may be, you know, so that's a separate decision-making process. So it could, you know, if you decide that transferring the units is, is fine because it's within proximity, it's, you know, um, it maybe makes it easier to develop as a common area, that's one decision. A separate, completely separate decision is how that really plays out on the plans at Burt's Bog. So I, I just want to make sure you're not concerned about sort of pre-approving something you haven't seen yeah. across the street. <clears throat> But you told me earlier we are the planning board already had approved the plan for for 10 individual lots so what probably would come back to you is sort of the center block merged as one common development as opposed to having 10 individual parcels so it would be a big amendment to the original plan mm -hmm. it would be a new plan right well, if i could also um I believe on this parcel there have been three RFPs. Wasn't the original one uh, where there was a buyer for the six lots who then backed out? There right. was a there was a subsequent RFP that nobody responded to, and then the third RFP right. that we responded. Yep. So there have been other attempts to have suitors. Yes, the suitors haven't shown up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what about this issue of precedent that some of you raised? about the idea that 15 years down the road, some of these labs say we're going to move these units off. How much of a concern is that from a, from a, um, this is a procedural standpoint? Yeah, this is, this is an, a specific decision about this project and this amendment. It, you should not feel that you're setting precedent for any other permit that comes in. But it's a learning experience. Well, <laughs> So, when are we? <laughs> well, we, I think, Yuri, we have to decide whether or not we want to release these lots in, with a very strong contingency, allow them to be released with a very, very strong contingency that if things don't work out, we guarantee that, we guarantee that, then they come back to um, Emerson Way across the street yeah, to and remain as affordable housing. Yeah, the, the, the lots never got transferred, right? But we're talking about releasing the restriction, which would then be reimposed. Correct, right, which would be reimposed across the street as affordable housing. So the Emerson LLC would still be doing their intent from back in 2003 of providing affordable housing lots and structures, more or less, in the city, just not in that neighborhood. 
well, in the same neighborhood, but not. But not in the neighborhood. Yeah. And they're very different, different neighborhoods. neighborhoods. Very different neighborhoods. And then leaving one duplex <coughs> to stand alone. Right. Amongst right. a community of larger homes, yeah. Yeah. which we talked about, that they may feel, or may not feel, odd anyway. And now we're just going to leave them as a solo mm -hmm. group. Right. Which seems. But the reality of the past eight years at least is that those lots may remain fallow and Emerson LLC will not develop them as affordable housing. They will be here in 2025 and they'll still be just empty lots because they can't work, make the numbers work. And we have to say that those lots, as Rich suggested, could not be sold. I think that was right. the suggestion until Habitat or some similar organization had an approved plan for affordable housing across the street. Would that be the deal? Well, it would be for minimum of six additional right. units beyond what was already envisioned across the street, which were too long. Six additional, well, but they're all single family units. Right. It doesn't matter. It's really it doesn't. It's just the total number of units. I wouldn't be concerned about single versus duplex. Six additional over over what? Over well, currently it was envisioned that we had two affordable units at Burtsbach. So those were already approved. Essentially, the concept. So it would be six plus two, so minimally eight. So we'd say have to say six. E units over those two that have already been approved. It's three. Uh, yeah, I think it was three. 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 For yeah. three for so that's why that's how we came up with nine, right. six plus three. So, so do we end up with more affordable in theory more if there's still two at Emerson Way and then nine across the street? No, it's the same. It's the same. It's the same, it's the same mm -hmm. from Emerson Way. Yeah. Okay. Nine out of the ten building lots in Birch Bog would be affordable housing. Is that what I'm hearing? Nine, well, of the, the, nine of the ten units of the living houses, which are going to be single family, are going to be affordable housing. Right. The concept, so th this is getting way into the details. So the concept is to redesign that ten lot. So there's still be two, there's still be sort of three lots out of the ten that are not going to be habitat. So there will be nine units plus three total, which will be 12, but only if the board approves it and they can address this infrastructure. Well, we would just address the nine affordable ones. Right. There would have to be a total of nine or whatever else they do. Yes, exactly. Uh, so there would yeah. have to be nine, there would have to be a plan submitted and approved by the board for nine affordable units right. across the street. Right. At which point the restriction would be removed from the three lots on Emerson Way, right. but if it's not approved, they, those, the restriction would remain. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, nine units. Okay, so how? I just want to just say one last thing. We spent a lot of time and effort, and if you look at the plan of what Steve would bring up the affordable home, it, it's a very nice home, and we've decided to, to really match what's in the neighborhood. So we, we, we try to be as thoughtful as we can in terms of, of making sure that that did not stick out in any way. But the economics says that you can't provide three more of these duplex units in Emerson Way over the next five years. Well, we look at this as if it really comes to fruition, all three parties, the city, Habitat, Emerson Way, end up being winners. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last phrase. What, if, if, if this all works out, there's a lot of pieces that need to fall into place, but the city sells their land relatively quickly at a, at a reasonable price. Habitat has a, a, a unique situation in develop nine homes. Emerson Way makes a large contribution, but also as an economic development. All three parties, in theory, might benefit from this transaction. 
with all the housing across the street. Yeah, yeah. And, but obviously a lot of pieces in the puzzle have to fall together. This is the first piece. But you were just extolling the virtue of this house in Emerson Way. Well, we think it's particularly a nice affordable home. Well, I think to the point of would the, would the two people left in Emerson Way be sort of sore thumbs when that's the only two affordable units left in that place? I, I think that your point is yeah. that, that you design the house so that that won't automatically be the case. As best you can. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, even though I started out being pretty skeptical, I, I think as it presently is being proposed might make sense and result in the objective being accomplished just in a very different way. So I guess even though I'm, I'm apparently not going to vote, I think it might make sense. <coughs> Yeah, I, I think it might make sense too, just so they can move down the road and have those discussions with Habitat and work through that financing and see as long as we have an ironclad condition that, you know, within, I, I don't know what, 24 months? You know, I, I don't know how long we wait before the, the lots get again renamed as a, a affordable in Emerson, in Emerson Way. But, yeah, I think I that you can, you don't need to put a timeline on it. You can just um, require that, um, you know, before even the next building permit is pulled, that you see a covenant restriction on those three lots stipulating that they cannot be released um, until um, the nine units have been approved at Birds Bob, and then that gets reported. Well, do we need a restriction because there's already the permit? We would be saying that the restriction in the original permit doesn't get released until a subdivision plan is submitted and approved. So that the, the, their permit essentially contains the covenant, right? You mean their existing permit? Right. Well, there's no restriction on the release of those lots for development, though. They're only there's they they're supposed to be affordable lots. But you see, so what you're saying is you're going to approve that those lots are not no longer need to contain those duplex units. That's the subdivision amendment. But the condition is that they're not released for sale as market rate lots. Right until such time as the nine units have been approved across the way. And yeah. we might as well identify the three lots, just to be clear. Yeah. And I might say, not just that they're released for sale upon approval of the plan, but perhaps upon construction of three lots. What if there, the three lots across the way were constructed, and then one of the lots, it was a good program, one of the lots then would be released totally for sale at Emerson Way. When three more are built, another lot at Emerson Way is at least a few some. Problem is, as Rich said, they can't control when Habitat builds. Yes. Once Habitat has the subdivision approval then, and, and owns the lots, we, we, then it's up to them. Well, we have confidence in Habitat. We'll take that on. We'll agree to that. Much as like we heard the example of Garfield that has taken 15 years to build out those. It, they may never get built out there. there. <laughs> and, and there could only be three then afford, uh, you know, families within the affordable guidelines living there instead of the six in Emerson Way. And, and I certainly understand about Habitat, yeah, but I think there has to be a little bit more rather than just approval of the plan. That's in line with that. Well, right. The applicant has just said that, that he would go along with saying what, what you just suggested. So let's do that. Okay, so the lot numbers are um, four and five. Uh, do you want to run 
through the numbers just 25 so we have and 26 and 39 and 40. So two things, I'm just hearing this so, so, so you can run through it and be um, sh sure. So prior to issues of the next building permit at Emerson Way, a lot cell covenant restriction for lots 4, 5, 25, 26, 39, and 40 shall be recorded at the Registry of Deeds indicating that um, they, in accordance with subdivision rules, that they um, not be released without signature from the planning board. Basically that means that would require them to get you to sign off and that, that the threshold would be um, the um, approval, uh, I'm sorry, the um, build out of um, units at Bergsbach, is that right? Right, yeah, well, it's a building permit. Okay. So we're saying they can't pull in more permits on Emerson Way until we have some kind of definitive something happening at Hertz Fog? No. So the, the next building permit for Emerson Way um, can't be pulled until they record a covenant restriction for those three lots that stipulate okay. that that restriction won't be, the lot sale covenant won't be released until they've met the threshold of, you know, um, two units, uh, then two more, then two more. Or Three and three really is it nine? Well, so three of them aren't within this. Right. Yeah, so it's two just and two six and two. that they're yeah. obligated okay. to. So it would be one lot per three house, two houses? Two houses, and, and then, then one lot gets yeah. sold, so to speak, at Emerson Way, and then two more houses. And I think, Ellen, what you said is the building permits are pulled on two more houses. I mean, yeah, I think it should be tied to building permits. So but couldn't they take out all six building permits at once? Well, and, and not if Habitat wants to do that, I guess. Building permits are only valid for six months, so it mm -hmm. really only makes sense to work on one. And especially the way they do it so slowly. It's so, slow. so we don't want to see a house a CO provided on the two houses and then the lodge over at Emerson Way, one lot is able to be sold. So that families yeah, can should be two do. unit, two dwelling two units, dwelling. however they choose to build. Yeah, because yeah. the plan may change. How about a CEO for the two two dwelling units? Right. So you know, if you think about, it, you can make that decision. Um, building permit means that the plan's already been approved by the board, and they have a design that's ready to be permitted right. at the building department. Right. Um, given that um, construction isn't necessarily so fast as it is on the private market, um, that would be a much longer window probably from building permit to CO. So just keep that in mind. I mean, you, you yep. can tie right. it the way you want, right. but I think building permit certainly is um, sufficient because right. at that point you're ready to go. Yeah, not, not CO. Right, that's, that's what I have. Sure, but if they get the building permits, something happens to the, the, the general contractor, material cost, they've already sold that parcel of land in Emerson Way, boom, and now the buildings aren't put up, right? But if Habitat's pulling a building permit, they're gonna build the building. And they're, and, and they, it's all, you know, it's, it's volunteer labor. Yeah. Um, so they're still gonna build the building. Okay, because so. They're obligated as long as they as long as it's two to one kind of as long as then they don't pull out two more building two permits. units for the lot release yeah. Okay. Yeah. for the building permit yeah. you know they it's not like these are the only three lots they have on emerson way they from what i heard they have approximately 20 more lots that they're marketing now and can be sold it's not like we're right yeah, that's or this isn't going to hold them yeah. up. They'll just yeah. sell another one. <coughs> so, do you want to take a vote? 
book, and I have to read. Are you voting? Um. So. Um, so, um, so prior to the issuance of the, so you want to read the, what the, um, you would want to read what the request is to release the conditions. Is the request is Sure. Unless I got called. 7.30 p.m.? Yeah. yeah. This yeah. One. yeah. 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 I don't have yeah. That's the new one. So for this, those um, lots, um, so that um, language and then uh, with the condition um, that prior to the issue, so the next building permit in Emerson Way, um, a lot sale covenant restriction shall be recorded for Lots 4, 5, 4, slash 5, 25, 26, 39, and 40 um, in, in compliance with subdivision regulations that state the lots may not be released um, for sale until such time at, on a lot by lot basis that two units of affordable housing are built for a total of six. Wait, are we going to say built or, or I'm sorry, CO. building? Building permit. Yeah, I mean, not a seal, building permit. Building right. permit. Yeah. Um, may not be released until building permits are issued for two units. And um, two, two units for a total of six at Burt's Bog. Through the motion for the um, subdivision amendment um, as stated by the staff system. Secretary there. Uh, the, by Emerson Way LLC map ID 3668 to allocate six previously identified portable units to another site um, at Bogs, Burks Bog, um, with the conditions um, recently expressed by our staff system chair. And then say first motion. So that's what I moved on. Second. 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 Now second. All good. That's okay. Vote there. So just three of us. So three of us. You know, I'm voting on this. Given that there's still going to be a lot of negotiations going on. Um, and the that they may come back to us, it'll be the same as before. Um, but let's hope that it's worse. Yes. Thank you for allowing us to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Uh, okay. 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 Ok